Here we are in a new year, uh, midway through, or at least we hope we're, we're midway through a pandemic. Uh, and it's been a tumultuous time. And the, the subject I chose here for the last of our talks is one that maybe is a little balm for the soul at this point in the year and in our human history. The themes in the Kummer collection uh, of the Pieta and the Lamentation are particularly rich. If you've been to our museum, you've probably seen a number of the, the spectacular works I'm gonna be talking about tonight, but you may not have realized their connection to each other and their, their concentration here as a part of the collection, which treats, I think, this very profound and very important theme of compassion. You, uh, if you have been to the cover uh, recently, uh, you may remember this little piece, which was the subject actually of a special exhibition organized by David Arriford, colleague in Massachusetts and a Jacksonville native uh, who uh, told me he long had this piece in the Commerce Collection as one of his personal favorites. It's a spectacular little painting with a gold background depicting the Virgin Mary in a little ledge, almost looks like a, the left hand and the, the, the lintel of a window. She leans out towards us, her open palm gestures, and she holds in her right hand uh, a, a fold of her hood, which she seems to be bringing to her face. Her red cheeks, her red eyes, the lids swollen of her eyes with tears, the tears streaking her face, uh, offer us one of the most striking images in the Kummer collection and in late medieval art of the representation of emotion. In fact, this painting is almost pure emotion because there's no story, there's nothing else happening. The painting itself looks like it almost might be a kind of, of a clip, a cutout, a crop out of a larger picture. What is she looking at? What is she gesturing toward? This painting, which is in our, our medieval and uh, early Renaissance collections, is a painting often known as the mother of sorrows, a subject known as the mother of sorrows or in Latin, mater dolorosa, uh, which means the same thing was quite a common late medieval subject. But as I say, it looks almost like something is missing. The window jam is present only on the left and the ledge underneath and the right side and the top of the painting are unbound. Uh, it is mysteriously incomplete. It is a painting that is closely connected to a sculpture in the uh, adjacent room a sculpture by the German sculptor Peter Breuer depicting one of the most famous subjects in the history of art, the Pieta. And almost everyone in the room probably will be familiar with Michelangelo's Pieta in the Vatican, which is perhaps the most famous sculpture in the world. Our Pieta is carved in lime wood and it represents in some sense, a more complete version of the subject we just looked at here again, is the suffering virgin, her eyes swollen with tears, her face stricken. She wraps her hand again in a fragment of the cloth from her veil, which she seems now to use to cradle the arm of the Christ who is resting across her lap. This is the body of Christ after it has been removed from the cross and uh, lowered before it is to be lowered into the grave. The Pieta actually is a subject which has no biblical basis. And that in itself is interesting. We know according to the gospels that Christ was crucified. And we know that his body was taken down from the cross, a subject we call the deposition or the descent from the cross. But there is no biblical account of what happened between the lowering of the body and the burial of the body. So this image of the mother cradling the child is in many ways an invented scene that shows us the tender final interaction of mother and, and son. The subject itself, the title, Pieta in Italian, is a word that means both piety and pity. It's a word that goes to the heart of the question of compassion and connection of one human being to another and of our capacity through that connection 
that filial piety or maternal piety, the devotion to our son, to our parent, our devotion to another person, that that theme of compassion, of pity for another comes into play. The word compassion actually is a fascinating term for me. It's a term that is very medieval. It's redolently medieval. We call the story uh, of Christ's crucifixion and his death, his burial, we call this collectively, these stories, the passion of Christ. Passion is a word in Latin that means suffering. To be passionate is to suffer intensities of feeling. And so passion itself, the passion of Christ, is the suffering of Christ at the end of his life. Compassion thus means not just sympathy with another, but suffering with that feeling of intensity of connection that we often feel as, as mothers or fathers of children, as children of parents, as brothers and sisters. And, and the great marvel of our humanity is that we're capable of feeling that even for people who are not directly related to us. The possibility of human compassion, the possibility of fulfilling that, that destiny of feeling for another is what preserves our humanity from all of the violence and all of the cruelty of which we are capable. The theme of the Pieta is closely related to yet another theme in the Kummer collection, the lamentation. In fact, for an art historian, these subjects are all essentially the same thing. The mother of sorrows represents the, the mourning virgin, the virgin who's mourning her child. The Pieta represents the, mor the mourning virgin holding her child. The lamentation represents the Virgin Mary, her child and other people. It is the representation of the figures who were historically present at the crucifixion. In this case, the mother Mary, the follower Mary Magdalene, who here embraces Christ's hand, and the disciple John, all of whom are mentioned as being present biblically at the crucifixion and the entombment of Christ. In addition, sometimes in the Lamentation, we see, as in another extremely famous painting in the Kummer collection, the Peter Paul Rubens' Lamentation. We see the presence of the elderly Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the followers of Christ, who, according to the biblical text, lowered Christ's body down from the cross, in addition to John and Mary and Mary Magdalene. But now Rubens has gone another step from, from that isolated image of the, the mourning and suffering virgin to the Pieta, to the Lamentation, we've now expanded the cast of figures who are present to include these other strange figures, including a woman who we see from behind, whose hair seems to be bound by a kind of wreath, and another whose long hair, disheveled and flowing, blonde, and her breasts unveiled, uh, it seems to be another figure taken almost from a kind of antique Greek kind of imagination of a Greek chorus, these are figures who exist primarily as lamentary figures, as figures to lament and to cry and to bewail the death of Christ. The lamentation, the pieta, the mother of sorrows, these are our themes today. And I think I, one of the wonderful things about the Kummer collection is the way in which if you spend time with it, the more you learn, the more you see interrelations and connections between the parts of the collection the themes and the histories of these subjects. These paintings were all made at different times in different parts of the world. And their connection to each other is what makes museums so great that we are able to find not just single paintings hanging on a wall, but something like the story of history and the story in this case of a particular idea of compassion, of feeling and feeling in particular through the medium of art, which is so capable of evoking emotion and drawing out our own feelings. That wonderful painting with which I started, The Mother of Sorrows, is, as I said, a picture that seems almost incomplete. We know what she must be looking at, what she must be weeping, but it's not depicted. Instead, we uh, see through the single focus on the Virgin, through the intensity of the focus on her face, 
and to the careful, meticulous, painted description of her red-rimmed eyes glistening with tears in the thick, viscous, pearl-like tears streaking down her face, her flushed cheeks, we see the artist digging deep into his, uh, his toolbox for the representation of emotion. This was a new thing in the 15th century when the so-called master of the Stutteritz altarpiece painted this work. We don't know who the painter was, which is why we have given him this, this master, this anonymous name, but he was probing a new territory of art. For hundreds of years after uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fall of Rome, throughout the Middle Ages, there was very little emphasis on the representation of feeling in medieval art. It is not until we get to the Renaissance that we begin to explore the genuine expression of the realistic expression of feeling and emotion. And in this case, the interest in the representation of emotion has much to do with the effect of seeing people in states of sadness on the viewer. You've all probably had this experience, weeping with people who are weeping on the screen of a movie uh, or coming to tears when someone uh, in the room with you is brought to tears. I know my daughter, no matter how much uh, uh, she resists it, cannot help weeping and crying if someone else in the room begins to cry. She feels deeply uh, through her sense of empathy, their emotion. And seeing, hearing, not only weeping, but also laughter and other states of intense emotional feeling can provoke in us the same experience. Uh, we are wonderful social animals in that way. We are generally very sensitive to how other people are feeling. That capacity for compassion is a wonderful aspect of our human psychology. And it is exactly what the artist is trying to play upon here. The artist is working in a new mode in, in relation to an idea of what we call effective piety. That is an act of religious devotion in which we feel, we connect to, we humanize the subjects of the art through the representation of emotion. We participate in their very human feelings of emotion. The artist Giovanni Bellini painted a Pietà and around the same time as our little picture was made, 1470 here, and uh, Bellini's Pietà is a wonderful example of this. In fact, it's very quite explicit about this intention. Bellini's Pietà represents John and the Virgin Mary holding the body of Christ, cradling the body of Christ, which bears its wounds from the cross. And Mary turns her cheek close into her son uh, and her face is obviously stricken. The ruddy, complexion of her cheeks and the pallid complexion of Christ's bespeak the, the living and the dead here. Uh, the, the green underlayer of paint is allowed to show through the translucent white skin of Christ in order to suggest his, his, uh, his death, the pallid character of his body. Bellini's picture has an inscription on the bottom, a wonderful inscription, which says, in a sense, in effect, uh, if this painting, uh, uh, it's as if this painting could cry through the medium of your own tears. That is to the extent that you are brought to tears by this picture. So also does the painting itself seem realistically to weep and to cry. It embodies a realism of emotion that the artist was striving for in order to move us to tears. And if you've ever been brought to tears or to laughter by a work of art, by a movie, by a song, then you know exactly the effect that Giovanni Bellini was aiming for. To move us to a place of understanding through the power of effective representation. That's exactly what our picture is aiming to do as well. As I said, it is somewhat like a little clip out of a larger picture. In fact, uh, that really is, in a sense, what it is. From the 15th century, uh, 16th century, 15th century, around the same time as our picture, here is a little excerpt of another painting, which shows almost exactly the same subject. Here's the Virgin with tears streaking her, her face, 
with their hands clasped in a pleading gesture of prayer. This is, in fact, a cropped view of a painting by Roger van der Weyden of the crucifixion, which fills in the larger scene. Here is the Virgin cradled by John collapsing in grief as they behold the body of Christ still on the cross. But our picture is not a cropped view. It is not a cutout from a larger painting. It is a complete picture in itself. It is exemplary of a late evolving type of the representation of the crucifixion, which had evolved across hundreds of years, going back really to the early Middle Ages. It's the end of a long progression of representations of biblical subjects and of representations of Mary and Christ that generated among other subjects, the, pie, the Pieta, the Lamentation, and then finally, the Mother of Sorrows. This Mother of Sorrows subject was quite common during this period. We find it in the work of here of Dirk Boots, almost exactly the same model, the gold background, the hands clasped in prayer, the thick tears upon the face. And here from a, a few decades later, the Mater Dolorosa of Jus van Cleve, and another by Lucas Cranach, here a full body figure, which shows in some ways more powerfully and more effectively when we zoom in for a close up. <coughs> uh, as you can see, that is really quite a gripping image, as gripping, in fact, for the scumbled and damaged surface of the painting itself, which seems to scar the Virgin. Uh, in a way that makes her even more sympathetic and pitiful. El Greco in the late 16th century, and here from the 17th century in Spain, sculptures which represent the same subject here in an, an almost impossibly lifelike sculptural medium, the bust of the Mater Dolorosa by Pedro Roldan from 1670, and Pedro de Mena, in 1674, or when we zoom in, we can see those thick tears hanging on the cheeks of the Virgin and calling out for us to sympathize with the Virgin herself. Now, as I say, these subjects are uh, very ancient. Uh, they have ancient roots and have been evolving for a long time. The evolution of the representation of the crucifixion and of the events around the crucifixion uh, uh, took hundreds of years to reach this point. Emotion, as I have said, was not an important subject in art until the 15th century. When we go back to around the year 1000, uh, 500 years almost before, uh, we can find a representative image of the crucifixion here, for instance, from this wonderful manuscript, the Sacramentary of Henry II, which represents the crucifixion, Christ on the cross, very different from the body that we've seen in the previous images. He seems to hang uh, rather painlessly and without, without much effect. Uh, let's make sure we're on um, you. All right. Uh, the, um... <laughs> let's see, can we make sure, Lois, uh, can you mute yourself, please? The uh, figures to the left and to the right of the cross, John and Mary, are not shown in attitudes or positions of mourning as they are in our later subjects. In fact, the Virgin is pointing to the Christ figure herself. She holds one hand out in an open palm gesture, which is a gesture of, I'm presenting something to you. And with the other hand points with the index finger. She is in fact a version of the, the Byzantine subject that we call the Virgin Hudegetria, the Virgin who points the way. She is dispassionately uh, uh, pointing to the Christ child rather than betraying emotion. This is a, a very ancient tradition of representation of the, of the crucifixion, which goes back to the beginnings of Christian art. Uh, for the first five, 600 years of Christian art, in fact, the figure of Christ on the cross was never shown in suffering or in death. The death of Christ itself is not a subject that's represented in art until almost the year 1000. Uh, for the first hundreds of years of medieval and Christian art, uh, the subject of Christ on the cross is what we call the Christus triumphans, the triumphant Christ. 
uh, an image of an undying, unsuffering body that overcomes death through the cross rather than succumbing to death. It's an image that anticipates not the death of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ. And so the representation of blood, of suffering, of pain, of gravity bearing down on the body, of mourning, of sadness, almost all of that is absent in representations of, of the crucifixion before the year 1000. It's not until, in fact, the 11th century that we begin to see the very first representations of the death of Christ in medieval art. And one of the very first representations is this image of the deposition, the descent from the cross, which is based on the biblical account. So at least it is rooted in uh, the evidence of the gospels. We see here now a very different image. The body begins to turn. We begin to feel here the weight of the arm and the body itself is represented in a posture of death. That increases as we move forward in time. The later we go, the more interest there is in connecting the viewer to an intimate feeling of the presence of the body of Christ. Here in the cloister of Santo Domingo de Silos in Spain, a wonderful cloister monastery, uh, the, um, uh, the body of Christ is being detached from the cross. But what's more important is the position of the sculpture in our space. It's right at about eye level. And the bottom part of the legs of Christ have been destroyed because viewers in the cloister over hundreds of years reached out to embrace the body of Christ, much like the figures in the image itself. They were reaching out to help to remove the nails and to feel the body and to be present in this way with the Virgin and Joseph and Nicodemus and John who are pictured in the image along with them. The descent from the cross thus was a completely different kind of subject uh, than the crucifixion. It was one which served not to show Christ's triumph, but to show his humanity and to connect us to his humanity so that we approach much like the people around him as participants at the scene of the crucifixion itself. We're invited to imagine just how traumatic it was, both physically and emotionally. This is that spot here, which has been destroyed unintentionally by the people who embraced this part of the sculpture. The descent from the cross became, in very short order, an important subject of prayer. We find it here, for instance, in a portable psalter, which was used for praying at the end of a particular psalm. The viewer would, would regard the image while they spoke the final words of the prayer and then connect themselves physically and spiritually to the image on the page. Increasingly, we see uh, representations of the descent from the cross, which are themselves part of a performance, much like the people who touch the body of Christ in the image in the cloister that I showed. This is a sculpture which could have been uh, mounted and removed from the cross in the performance of one of the first Easter plays, you may well uh, have participated in or seen or have read about passion plays, which have very ancient histories and go back to this moment in time around the year 1000, when the image of Christ's death becomes an important emotional and psychological subject. This is an example of a fully preserved sculptural group in which the bodies could be moved around like props in a play, like uh, a large life scale nativity scene in a sense. Here we are in the, uh, the uh, hours of Etienne Chevalier, one of the great manuscripts of the 15th century in France by the artist Jean Fouquet, where we see an increasingly dramatic representation of the removal of the body, one that emphasizes the effects of gravity, the physics of the body, the, the dead body suspended here from the top by a, a straining figure who holds it in a sling as it's carried ponderously down to the ground. The whole thing has a feeling of being staged, like, a, like a, the highlight, uh, the, the climax of a play, which in many ways is kind of what it was. Another page from the same manuscript shows us the martyrdom of a saint. Here, uh, the figure is tied to a slab and is being poked and prodded. Her tongue is being torn out, her hair is being pulled. But in fact, the whole thing is just a performance. You can see in the background a stage or a, an audience that is uh, much like Shakespeare's Globe Theater, 
clustered in the wings. There are musicians playing the musical parts. And here is the jester, the clown figure who comes on to break up the scene. He's walking away, uh, scratching his rear in a, uh, a gesture which introduces a profane element into the scene. The figures before us are not actually historical figures. They are actors performing the scene. All of this is a reminder of the way in which this emphasis in late medieval culture on effective piety, on performance, and on participation in the drama of the suffering of the saints and of Christ was an important part of medieval art. Over here on the right-hand side, the devil is waiting his turn in the wings to come on stage and do his bit. As the subject of the Descent from the Cross develops, it places an ever greater emphasis on the drama of the body. Here in this wonderful picture by Bernardino Butinoni, we see this, the hand still uh, nailed to the cross and the other one hanging, the limp body forming this elegant but painful arc. As we go forward further in time, the drama of Peter Paul Rubens' descent from the cross with the heroic body of Christ lowered from the cross, everyone clustering around and touching it, the opportunity for everyone simultaneously to, to have a finger on the sacred body to participate in, in the feeling of Christ's humanity. Uh, that is an important part of the subject, brought even more uh, powerfully to us perhaps by Rembrandt, who envisions not the heroic body of Rubens, but this sad and nerveless figure, his lower midriff bulging as the, the, the lack of, uh, of, of muscle tone uh, causes the body to bulge and deform in all of the strange ways that it does. From that subject, the descent from the cross, we come to now the story of the lamentation, which has no basis in the Bible. It's a purely imagined subject. We know, of course, that Christ died and that his body was lowered and that it was buried, but the Bible says nothing about the mourning, the weeping, or the lamenting the, uh, uh, that, that we might imagine took place at the scene. So the lamentation is a subject that fills in that gap, that gives us uh, the, the visual opportunity to see, to imagine what the emotional scene was like. From the body of Christ as the focus, we now turn to the bodies of the mourners. In this image, the wonderful Rohan hours from the 15th century, John supports Mary, who now herself has fainted from grief, and her body is the one that collapses, and this beautiful arc as she reaches for her, her son, and John, uh, looking towards God in the heavens, restrains her or holds her up. That subject of the lamentation itself also goes back to the late 11th or perhaps the 12th century, one of the earliest subjects here from the, the Byzantine church of Neresi. Uh, Giotto, the famous uh, early Renaissance painter in Italy from the famous Scrovenia chapel in 1305, uh, the body of Christ now, as you can see, is less of a focus in the lamentation, and instead we're treated to this fantastic display of other figures acting their grief. John, in the center of the image, spreads his arms wide, embracing, as it were, uh, the image of the body of Christ. Um, one of the Marys here in the background clasps her hands against her cheeks, and Mary uh, Magdalene, perhaps, standing at his head, raises her hand in uh, a gesture of despair, while the angels turn and spin and swoop, uh, all of them, um, through their bodily performance, exhibiting their grief. This focus on the expressive bodies of the mourners is uh, eventually the, the thing that turns into the expressive faces of the mourners when we get to the mother of sorrows. These are also images often carved, which created the opportunity for a close connection to the performers in the scene. Here's the Virgin again, fainting with the angels wailing in the background. Some of the figures are positioned, cut off by the frame, turning their backs to us, almost like they are inviting us to enter into the scene with them and participate. 
As the lamentation develops, it develops an increasing focus on two different aspects. One, the bodies and expressions of the mourners, and two, the display of the body of Christ itself. You can see in this image, Simon Marmion, uh, the body of Christ is turned toward us rather than lying flat. It's almost displayed for us to see, as in also Albrecht Dürer's Lamentation, where John, behind the figure of Christ, seems to hold him by the armpits and turn him to the viewer so that we're able at once to engage in the display of emotion from the actors in the scene and ourselves to participate in the emotion by seeing the sight which triggers their expressions of anguish. So we are at once watching the anguish, participating in the anguish as present at the image of the, uh, uh, the suffering body of Christ. In Rosso Fiorentino's image, this cropped view brings us very close to the action and puts us just in this circle, on the edge of this circle of of mourning figures, their arms cast wide and their faces grieving the body of Christ displayed carefully before us. In the Kummer collection, we see that in the uh, wonderful uh, Counter-Reformation painting from Italy by uh, Giochino Assereto, which reveals in this way, the displayed body of Christ, as well as the effective gestures of the mourners who are kissing his hands, gesturing, drawing our attention to their grief and to the body of Christ simultaneously. We see that also in the Rubens picture here from 1601, the lamentation and closely related our beautiful painting, which if you've seen it, you know, is a small, beautiful painting on copper. Copper is a very lustrous surface and this is a most luminous work. The light shines behind the darkened chiaroscuro head of John and shines again behind the head of Christ as we're drawn into the picture and invited to, to join in. Everywhere we look, there's a figure at the elbow, at the head, at the neck, at the arm, at the shoulder, at the hip, at the foot of Christ, except for right here along the forward flank that faces toward us. And we are invited to enter into this work and to join the circle. That story of the lamentation and the focus on these two features of, this, of the story uh, are the virgin's passion and anguish, and the anguish of those who mourn Christ, and on the body itself of Christ, the, the damaged and pained and suffering body of Christ. These two things ultimately lead to a, re a refinement of the subject. The Pieta is in many ways simply a kind of reduced lamentation. It's a lamentation without all of the figures. It's a subject in particular that emphasizes the close relationship between Mary, the mother, and Christ the Son, and that plays then on the, the power of maternal feeling and of, of the, the relationship between a child and a parent. The Pieta is distinguished in the Lamentation generally by the, by the fact that Christ is placed in the lap of Mary. Even if there are other figures present, sometimes we call this still the Pieta. It's Mary, however, who plays the dominant role in her relationship to the figure of Christ, embracing him, holding him in her lap. And the intensity of the connection between them is it, what is at stake in this story. Again, pieta is a word that means both piety in the sense of, of filial piety, of our devotion and devotedness to the people that we owe devotion to, but also pity in the, in the sense of compassion. And the word pieta, pietas in Latin, literally means both of these things. It means compassion, affection, feeling, love, but also devotion, duty, loyalty. Here in Jean Fouquet's Pieta, the body of Christ in the lap of the Virgin. And generally, however, we're used to much more uh, reduced images of the Pieta in which it is just Mary and the Christ child. And you can see here, her pinched expression and pained and sad as she holds the child in her lap, the grown child, displaying his body for us, even as she exhibits her emotional anguish for us as well. The Pietà was an incredibly powerful subject 
in medieval art, a very powerful and important subject devotionally and ritually, and uh, one that uh, uh, was incredibly common in all artistic media, in, uh, in painting and sculpture and manuscript arts, in metalwork and, and a variety of other media. Our Pieta by the artist Peter Breuer from around 1490, it's carved by a German sculptor in uh, Linden or Limewood. Uh, it's a wonderful piece. And I, uh, I, I love it in particular because it, uh, it betrays a history of use and devotion, which is itself fascinating. If we look closely at the mouth of the Christ figure in uh, uh, the Pieta at the Kummer, you'll see evidence of wear and of rubbing, which like the sculpture I showed you in the cloister suggests that it's an object of touch, that it has been touched and uh, caressed over the years. That image of the piety uh, of the Pieta, which reduces the story of the Lamentation to just the presence of the Virgin and Christ, is exactly what gives us eventually the story of the Mother of Sorrows. And we see here a kind of precursor, a Pieta in which Mary no longer holds the Christ. Uh, he is instead in the tomb and kind of rises out of the tomb. It's not a story, an image that makes any sense physically. His body uh, shouldn't support itself, and she doesn't seem to be supporting it either. It's a miraculous kind of image, one that focuses entirely on her relationship as an anguished mother and on his presence as a, uh, a sacrificial body. And it's that focus on her anguish and on his wounds, which defines two of the most important late medieval subjects that emerge from this tradition of the deposition the Lamentation, and the Pieta. What we call the Mater Dolorosa, the Mother of Sorrows, and the Vir Dolorum, or the Man of Sorrows. We see a good example here in which a pair meant to go together, but in separate frames, side by side, give us that figure of the, the Kummer Mother of Sorrows, along with the torso, just the, the upper half of the figure of Christ himself. Here, no one carries him. He's both alive and dead. This is the Christ figure who is dead but undying, lowered from the cross, awaiting the resurrection, and exposing himself to us as an object of devotion, primarily so that we, like Mary, can experience that feeling of compassion, that feeling of being with someone in their suffering. This was an extremely common subject, often with the pairing of the Mater Dolorosa and the Man of Sorrows, although they could also appear separately, alone, independently, uh, as subjects by themselves, as in this wonderful picture by Michele, uh, Michele Giambano, uh, the Man of Sorrows from 1430. Our picture of the, the Virgin of Sorrows is certainly uh, an image like that. Perhaps at one time it did have a pair or a partner, or perhaps it was alone an independent image, which simply condenses for us this, this vivid and uh, uh, viscerally effective image of the suffering and mourning Virgin. In uh, another example, a wonderful picture from the, uh, the 16th century, we see a print with a prayer connected to it the, this is a hand colored print so that after the wood block was made, someone came back in and, and applied rubrics. Rubrics are literally mean red letters and they were useful for reading so that you could follow a line and know where it started. It's like having a large initial or something like that or making a note in the margin. The artist, however, uh, also applied rubrics to the image, highlighting the wound in Christ's side, the drips of blood on his shoulders, his lips, and the lips of the Virgin. All of those suggest that like the, the function of the rubric in the text, the viewer was reading the image for these important signs and marks. And like the lips of our Pieta at the Kummer, it suggests perhaps that the, the viewer and the reader as they read the prayer below was themselves interacting with the image, perhaps touching the lips, the wound, connecting himself to those images of suffering and of anguish. In this case, the Virgin is uh, depicted in a variation on the Mother of Sorrows in which her heart is literally pierced by a sword. 
It is finally, however, perhaps the Pieta that is most famous today. And, and, and uh, not many people know, unless you've done some research on the history of medieval art, that all of these subjects are essentially one and the same. The mother of sorrows, the man of sorrows, the Pieta, the lamentation, they all have essentially the same roots. Our Pieta, uh, which is quite a wonderful example of the type, is uh, 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 an image that in many ways exemplifies the type. It, the Pieta is most famous, however, probably not because of this long tradition, but as you all know, probably because of Michelangelo, whose mold breaking and his extraordinary uh, work uh, in, for many of us defines the type. The Pieta is much more ancient though than Michelangelo's work. It had been around for hundreds of years by the time he treated the subject. And it was a deeply important theme before Michelangelo got hold of it. It was, as I said, uh, an important religious subject and a devotional subject. This is a, what we call a prayer knot. It, it's a, a, an item that would be part of a rosary. And when you prayed the rosary in penitential prayer, you would actually open the knot and inside this uh, globe, these are the two halves of it, you would find an image. On the left, we see an image of the Virgin and Child. And on the right, we see an image of the Pieta, of the Christ in Mary's lap. And that image of the mother with her child in his infancy and the mother with her child at his death is a really powerful juxtaposition. Seeing the image of the Pieta by itself was an act of prayer and devotion. And in fact, there were indulgences offered by the church during this time, simply for looking at an image of the Pieta while you prayed. So it was an extremely powerful and important picture. And a lot of Pieta images quite different from Michelangelo's were designed to create the kind of effective emotional experience, the participation in compassionate anguish that we've been talking about during our lecture today. The Rutgen Pieta is one of the most interesting and famous, and the artist really has uh, a fun time with the blood coming out of the wounds of Christ, thick piles, almost worm-like piles of blood hang around the wounds like melted wax. Uh, it's a really vivid image, and the distorted proportions of the body of Christ uh, angular and emaciated, his bones seeming to come through and the head hanging at that strange angle, all create this very powerful raw image of physical and emotional suffering. Many images of the Pieta were like this, in featured distortions of proportion and scale, so that here the body of Christ is reduced almost again to the size of a child as he lies on his mother's lap, with an improbable number of ribs showing through his emaciated flank. And many of these pictures were, were painted uh, like this uh, very modest, very humble image from around 1400, depicting the body covered over with marks from the flagellation, from the scourging of Christ. Which all brings us to Michelangelo. Michelangelo's Pieta, which as I said at the beginning of our talk is perhaps the most famous sculpture in the world. It is a work of exquisite beauty. And in that, it is different from the Pieta as we've seen it today. The Pieta is, let's be honest, often an ugly subject and it was meant to be so. It was meant to be disturbing and to arouse our feelings of compassionate pity of anguish, of emotional participation in the physical and psychological suffering of the subjects. Michelangelo's Pieta is almost too pretty to do that kind of work. The youthful virgin, unbelievably demure and beautiful beneath her hood, the body of Christ, uh, almost as in sleep rather than in death, lies across her lap. The marble is so exquisitely worked and the, the, the sculpture itself is such a, a, an astonishing display of virtuoso technique that we marvel at its beauty as much as we, we uh, deplore and sympathize with its subject. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it is a very powerful experience. 
as much for our sense of being in the presence of artistic genius as for our sense of being in the presence of uh, a disturbing and terrible event. So in that sense, I have to say, I think Michelangelo in many ways broke the mold. He both changed the nature of our sense of the subject and also created a work which could not be surpassed uh, in either direction, perhaps. Michelangelo's work really did change the, the tone of the Pietà for the centuries to come because this work itself became quite famous very rapidly. Uh, it's not just famous today, it was famous in Michelangelo's own time. And from the time it was made, there are stories that circulated about it the, uh, uh, that increased its fame. It was made, in fact, as a commission to honor the tomb of a cardinal of the church, who in his will commissioned the work as a work that would be more beautiful than any other. <laughs> that was his goal, a, a modest and humble goal, right? Uh, Michelangelo uh, wonderfully followed through on the contract and produced something that arguably could be said to be more beautiful and more, more artistically powerful than any work that came before. But even in its inspiration then, the work set out to create a different kind of effect on the viewer, an effect that thrills our sense of compassionate connection through beauty and through technique, rather than by playing on our emotions in the way that the medieval Pietà did. It's nevertheless a, uh, a beautiful work. And even it has some stories that cling to it that remind us of that old medieval tradition of the Pietà. According to one of the great legends, uh, uh, the, uh, the historian Vasari writes that Michelangelo was in the chapel one day when a group of Milanese tourists came through and uh, they said, oh, well, that's a really beautiful sculpture who made it. And, and one of them volunteered that it was some sculptor from Milan, where they were from. Michelangelo, according to this account, overheard them, didn't correct them, but was outraged that anyone would think that this was someone else's work. And so he went back in the dead of night. And according to this, this story, he carved his name onto the work. It is the only work that Michelangelo ever signed. And indeed, right here on this strap across the Virgin's chest, we find the words, Michelangelo Buonarroti uh, made this sculpture, Fakieva. And uh, that is a wonderful story. According to the, the, the story as Vasari tells it, he was there in the, in the chapel in the Vatican in the middle of the night, carving his, his name on the sculpture, when a, a recluse, a female nun who lived in a small cell in the church, a woman known as a murate, uh, that is a person who lives in a tiny cell-like prison-like chamber within the church as a hermit in plain sight, heard the noise of him carving his name on the sculpture and came out because she thought somebody was attacking the new work, the new sculpture. She was very alarmed and she called Michelangelo off, but when she realized who he was and what he was doing, she said, I want to thank you for making this work. It is the most beautiful and touching thing that I've ever seen. And I would beg you for this. Would you give me just a little bit of marble dust from the wound in Christ's side? And to oblige her, uh, Michelangelo did, according to this legend, he chiseled off a little bit of marble from inside the wound in Christ's flank and gave this dust to the woman who herself probably then consumed it. In exchange, she made Michelangelo an omelet. <laughs> and there ends the story. It's a story that is uh, wonderful as a kind of turning point because it represents the tradition out of which the Pietà came. This tradition in which we want to participate, we want to touch, we want to be a member of the tribe clustered around the body of Christ and participating in the depth of the feeling and the suffering that is taking place at this event. And now this image that we have of the Pietà in Michelangelo's work of an unapproachable, an impossibly lofty, an impossibly beautiful and perfect sculpture, one which is today quite literally held apart from us, raised above us uh, on a pedestal behind sheets of bulletproof glass. Uh, it is an inflection point 
a moment at which the Pietà turned from the story of intimacy and connection to the story of the most ideal vision of the beauty of Michelangelo's work. Our Pietà, just to conclude, has a, a connection to Michelangelo's work um, uh, that you might not imagine. And it is this, Michelangelo's work is perhaps the first Pietà never to have been painted. Michelangelo didn't want his work painted. Sculpture at the time was routinely painted and uh, the Pietà uh, was generally painted as well. In fact, it was just commonplace to paint sculpture. Michelangelo didn't want his work painted, of course, because if you covered over all of the beautifully carved material, you could hardly appreciate his artistry. So why gunk it up with a bunch of uh, uh, makeup and, and, and paint? He wanted that marble splendor. But with that marble splendor, we lose something very typical and very important about the Pietà. We lose the gruesomeness. We lose the visceral image of the suffering. Well, our Pietà is also not painted anymore. It was, of course. It was initially painted. Here's another Pietà by Peter Breuer today, where we see the pale body of Christ and the, the blood streaking down from the face. Or, for instance, another uh, Peter Breuer sculpture, a man of sorrows that should be bloody and was at one time probably painted, but now has been cleaned like ours. Uh, here, uh, another Peter Breuer, man of, man of sorrows, uh, which is still painted, retains its polychromy, gives us a sense of what perhaps our sculpture at the Kammer originally looked like. It too would have been covered and streaked in painted signs of the suffering of the body. And likewise, the Virgin's face, we must contemplate tears and we must contemplate artistic embellishments, which enhance the sense of her emotional suffering. The cleaning of our sculpture is a reminder of the change in the tone of that subject under Michelangelo's influence. The sculpture became more valuable, cleaned away with the paint revealing the workmanship and the craft of the sculptor than it would have been before. We have, in other words, at the Kummer, a wonderful collection of works that fit together in a story which paints the history of an entire theme in the history of Christian art. And beyond that, uh, a theme of great importance in the history of our human artistic enterprise, the power of art to create connection, to cultivate emotion, and to move us is something that we should never forget because it is a reminder of our fundamental humanity at a moment perhaps in history when we need it especially. So I want to thank you all, and I want to invite you to share your questions. You can share questions through the chat function on uh, our um, uh, Zoom medium, or you can, uh, yeah, look, we already have questions, so that's great. So I'm going to start right now. Um, when did the image of Mary start to appear? Uh, from the images shown, it looks like only in the late medieval and early modern periods. And no, that is not true. I just simply haven't gone back to the beginning. The image of the Virgin is a very, very ancient one and appears uh, with the beginning of Christian art virtually from the fifth century at least. Uh, the image of the Virgin is, is common initially in Byzantine art and the icon of the Virgin, I referred to the Hodigetria, for instance, is a subject that goes back incredibly far. And it's so far, in fact, that there's legends that the gospel author, Luke, was the first painter of the Virgin. According to tradition, some of the oldest paintings of the Virgin are ascribed to Saint Luke as the painter. And why do you think the depiction of emotion, especially suffering, became more prevalent during the medieval and Renaissance periods? Did the prevalence of plagues heavily influence that? That is a great question and could be a whole other talk by itself. And I will say just this, that there was an evolution uh, from the beginning of Christian art. We initially see a focus on themes that, uh, emphasize, uh, that emphasize eternal and sublime and ideal states. Uh, the death of Christ is rarely addressed. And this is a period during which Europe is still Christianizing. It was a hard pitch in many parts of, of pagan Europe to say that um, God is dead, which is essentially what you were saying if you acknowledge Christ's death on the cross. So it's not that they denied it, but they tended to emphasize not his death, but his resurrection. And so for that reason, uh, the image of Christ triumphing over death, it dominates until very late. That 
it begins to shift around the year 1000. We now uh, people are beginning to seek in one of the first periods of what we might call reformation, a whole change in religious culture in which there's now an interest in personal connection to, uh, to God. And so that personal connection is an intimacy that focuses on Christ's humanity and thus his suffering. He becomes like us in medieval art around the year 1000. He suffers. We recognize that and we identify with that. Um, and the Peter Breuer Pietas, Christ's body is out of proportion with Mary's. And that is definitely intentional. One, it's just a practical uh, function uh, that in medieval art, you could play with proportions. There was no obligation to make things correctly sized according to nature. And in this case, uh, the, the sort of pyramidal shape of the Virgin provides a platform for the Christ figure. And Peter Breuer is uh, perhaps simply not interested in the artistic effort it would take to come up with a way to fit that body in to the composition uh, in a naturalistic way. In particular, because Peter Breuer is also interested, like some of the art other artists we've shown, in displaying the body of Christ. So the body is turned toward us almost on, uh, on its side. And that's a way of exhibiting or displaying the body. And it's more convenient to display it in this less proportional way. It also suggests perhaps the idea that Christ is uh, uh, Mary's child. It creates a connection back to her, to her child um, uh, relationship. Uh, curious if you believe there could be a relationship between the cropping and inclusion of a frame within the Cummer's Lamentation, the popularization, popularization of women in frames, uh, windows, yes. So in art around this time, we begin to see artists using ledges and windows in paintings generally. And that's a way of creating realism, of drawing us into the picture and making figures feel very alive. And so the fact that there is a ledge here and Mary's leaning on it and her hand almost breaks the frame and comes out across the ledge, all of that is a way of drawing us into the picture, giving us a, a realistic, intimate connection with her. Um, another uh, uh, writer says, I'm always interested in performativity within static work and uh, the theatrics of these works certainly illustrate that. Also interested in the ways in which there are a few images that illuminate anachronisms. Um, are these uh, employed to further develop emotional relationships with the image or to locate the narrative within the time in which it was created? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what anachronisms you're talking about, but anachronisms are very common. Scott, I can, uh, there was one image in particular that you showed and I apologize because I didn't take the note down, but it specifically looked like this figure from the time period that the painting would have been made. And that figure was in the foreground, um, dressed in something totally different than what the rest of the figures were. And that was a moment where, I, I mean, there were a few anachronisms just compositionally, like the one piece where uh, it had the inscription and it's this they're in this like marble, you know, they're on this like marble uh, frame that is not quite located with, you know, what the, the scene would be. But particularly there was this one painting that you showed where in which there was this figure that all of a sudden it, it really felt like an anachronism. I mean, it was just this figure that costume nothing. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is outside of, uh, this was another image that was not what you mentioned about the play, right? Yeah. And the play directly doing that. So that's where I, I wondered if, moments of these kind of um, punctuating anachronisms or purposeful anachronisms were put in, in in order to draw the viewer. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica. And, that, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, these anachronisms are incredibly important exactly for those reasons. And they work in two ways, generally speaking. One, it's a way of inserting yourself into the picture. As I said, for instance, our Kummer uh, uh, Lamentation by Rubens, which has the empty space it's just inviting someone to come in and fill it and stand at the table. Uh, that, that is a way of uh, literally painting yourself into the picture and painting yourself in, uh, in your present form. Rather than dressing up in biblical costume, you assume your identity going into a historical narrative. But then it also operates in another way, that is that it transports figures from the past into the present. The medieval art is full of uh, a sort of, a, a, it goes back and forth between representing things in the way people imagined things looked back in the past and updating so that they look like the present. 
and, and, and humanizes them, introduces themselves into our own present space in a way that makes that, that experience very intimate and very present. So thank you. Um, seems to me that uh, these shifts in the way that the crucifixion and deposition are portrayed are theological in implication in addition to artistic. That is certainly true. In another big complicated subject, the developing theology around this is fascinating. And we see a shift to the representation of the death of Christ, the body of Christ, the suffering of Christ, at the same time that we see theologically a shift to uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation. And that's a whole big topic, a fascinating one to get into. But uh, in fact, that first subject that we see, the descent from the cross, which shows Christ in death, was itself a symbolic representation of the mass. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus lowering the body of Christ from the cross down to the grave was considered to be a symbolic image of the priest and the deacon during what we call the consecration of the mass, when the offerings are held and blessed and then lowered to the altar, which is symbolic of the tomb. And so there is a lot of theology going on, absolutely, which I'd love to go into further, maybe in a future talk. Um, uh, why is Christ's body always on the same diagonal plane? Uh, and you know what? I can't think of any, any uh, postures in which the posture is, re is reversed. My best answer is that this is Mary's right arm. So Christ always goes from the left to the right in our view, because the right arm, the right hand, is the good hand, the good side. Uh, and so that posture then aligns Christ on uh, Mary's uh, uh, right side. Um, her head on her right, his head on her right shoulder in a way that is very consistent. Uh, nice observation. Well, th those are wonderful questions. Uh, some of the richest questions I've ever had in a talk. I am so appreciative of them. I'm so appreciative of, of all of your participation in this talk today. Thank you all who have attended these sessions. I appreciate your support of the Cummer, the Cummer Beaches. I look forward to seeing you all again down at the museum. I think it's going to be, optimistically, I, I think it's going to be a wonderful year. We have a new director coming. There is energy, there's excitement. We have a vaccine in the pandemic and I hope that we all get it soon. And I hope that life gets back to normal. I miss the museum. I miss seeing you all there. I, I miss seeing my students. I know we are all looking for a return to normal. So while we're, while we're waiting and while we're working for that moment, uh, I hope that our, our talk today and the theme is something that you can all take with you. The more compassion we can show, the more empathy we can show for our fellow people, all of them, I think the better this world will be. So thank you all greatly. I wanna thank again, Diane Jacobson, the Cummer Beaches, uh, the Cummer Museum, and uh, all of you who made this possible.